Hi again. I am back with another story about a World War II vet. And actually it starts while he is serving. And it's a wonderful story. This time, this one is by Patricia Polacco. And I've already read you several stories by her. So I think you'll find this one equally enjoyable. This one is called Tucky Joe and Little Heart. Okay, so here it goes. I was born in Allen, Kentucky on October 3rd, 1924. I grew up like any backcountry boy in Kentucky. Together, tougher than last year's jerky and faster than a scared jackrabbit. I could whittle and carve just about any stick or wood, and I could sneak up on just about anything. Came right handy for hunting. My pa taught me how to use a shotgun when I was knee-high to a grasshopper. By my tw 12th birthday, I was known in three counties for sharp shooting. I could hit the eye out of a gnat from a furlong away, whilst I was dead run dodging a wild boar hog. I always took first prize over at the county fair for fancy shooting. I even caught the eye of the sweetest little old gal, Frida Hall, from over in Prestonburg way. I knew when I was old enough, I was going to spark her. Well, when I was 10 or so, we heard all about the war that broke out in Europe and that feller, Hitler. Then the paper said Pearl Harbor was bombed and we were at war with Japan in the Pacific. I told my ma that I was fixing to enlist in the army and go fight for my country. The only thing was I wasn't old enough to join up, even though I had promised my heart to Frida, I had to go. So soon enough, my folks lied me older when I went to sign up. Sure enough, the army took me that very day. And after my basic training, I was assigned to the 6th Infantry, Company G, 20th Division. Then we were deployed to the Pacific Theater on the biggest ship I ever saw. He was just a young kid. I was miserable sick the whole way. The onlyest boat I'd ever seen was a river raft back home on Hominy Creek. Being the youngest recruit on that there ship, almost everyone aboard was calling me that kid from Kentucky, or just the kid. At first, I didn't like them as saying that, but after I got to show them how good I was with a rifle and our sergeant picked me for special training as a marksman and for heavy ordnance explosives, they all looked up to me. I later became part of a very special unit that went into the jungle to seek and destroy mission gun nests and enemy outposts. Then the Kentucky kid moniker became a badge of honor. I could hardly wait to land and get into the thick of the fighting. Almost as soon as we landed, we were thrown into the worst of the conflict. I had never seen so much killing and suffering. Our division was sent to so many places to fight that everything started blurring together. My outfit was known as the Sightseeing Sixth because we held the record for the most consecutive days of continuous combat. We fought tooth and nail, cheek to jowl. We were in Milne Bay, then Maffin Bay, then Lone Tree Hill, New Guinea, Muniz, Muniz, and finally we were on our way to Luzon in the Philippines. We had been paddling for 
119 days straight. By the time we got to Luzon, I was blind tired. So tuckered, I could hardly put one foot in front of the other. I was plumb weary of the jungle. It was hot, steamy, stinking, and thick. And the bugs, I'd never seen so many bugs. There were snakes, lizards, and big spiders too. It rained every day. The ground was always damp and mushy. Our feet never got dry. To think that I wanted in on all this fighting. Now, I knew there ain't no glory in war, but I was in the army, and it was up to me to take a stand and fight for my country. But at night, I'd have dreams about my ma and her bacon powdered biscuits. I could even smell the pine boards in our house. I could see the green grass in the holler. Oh, how I wanted to be back home with my ma and my kin. My unit's mission on Luzon was to clear the jungle to build an airstrip and also to level the land to biovac and pitch our tents for an outpost. So just about every day, I was swinging a machete at thick underbrush and slashing vines. One day, I stopped for a swig of water from my canteen. The bugs were swarming all around me. Some of them were as big as my hand. All of them were stinging me. I was being eaten alive. I was a scratching fool. I had welts all over every inch of my skin. Some of them burned and hurt like the bites from fire ants back home. Then I heard rushing water. I pulled back the underbrush and saw a small native village just yonder from me at the bend in a river. I saw village women standing knee deep in the river trying to catch fish with their bare hands. This is a whole new world for him. Then sudden like, I could feel someone behind me. I turned real fast and drew up my rifle. Standing there like something out of a dream was a scrawny little old girl. She wasn't any bigger than a minute and looked weak as a fawn deer. I dropped to my knees and drank her in. Somehow looking at that innocent tiny girl gave me a peace I hadn't felt in a long time. She reached out and touched one of the swollen bug bites on my arm. Then she bent down and plucked a plump leaf from a ground-hugging plant. She broke it in half and squeezed the goo that was oozing out of it onto the bite. It was instant blessed relief. So both of us picked them leaves and put the medicine that came from them on all of my bites. Look at that sweet little girl. Thank you, thank you, little angel, I whispered. She just blinked at me, didn't smile, didn't say nothing, just looked at me with those beautiful haunted eyes. My name's Kentucky John, I said, as I pointed to myself. She cocked her head to one side. Kentucky Johnny, I said louder. She just stared. I got something you like. I said as I pulled a chocolate block from my K rations. I held it out to her. I knew she wanted it real bad, but she held back till I put it in her tiny hand. Then she stuffed the whole block in her mouth. I thought she'd choke on it. 
She chewed hungrily at it, barely taking breaths to swallow. Then both of us just sat there for the longest time. It made me feel calm and less homesick to be there with her. Wonder what your name is, I muttered. Then I noticed a small birthmark on her arm. It was shaped just like a perfect small heart. Little heart, I sang out. That's what I'm calling you, I whispered to her. Tucky Joe! She suddenly blurted out as she pointed at me. Tucky Joe, Tucky Joe, Tucky Joe, she sang as she turned and ran back into the jungle. I gathered up as many of them leaves as I could to take back to camp with me. His arms look so sore. It does look like those fire ant bites. And they hurt. When I got back, I showed the medics them leaves and how they make the bites better. Pretty soon, them leaves were being used to heal any kind of skin scrape. I figured it wasn't a good idea to tell anyone about Little Heart, being that sometimes natives were scouts and spies for the enemy. I guess I was afraid that our captain might think that, so I kept Little Heart as my own secret. I spent most of that night whittling a hinge dancing doll for that little girl. I'd made lots of them back home for my kin. We called them jiggly dolls. Each arm and leg were wired at the elbow and knees so that when you shook it, the arms and legs waved like they were dancing. Then I put the body and head on a stick. I couldn't wait to see Little Heart and show, to show her how to make it dance. That's the doll he made. The very next day, I made it my business to be in the same place where I first saw her. I waited and waited, and sure enough, she finally came. I pulled the jiggy dancer from my pack, attached the stick, and thumped it with my fingers. Sure enough, that little doll started dancing. Little Heart couldn't take her eyes off of it. Then she smiled, a smile so sweet and full that both of us clean forgot that a war was raging all over the island. After that, almost every single day, I'd meet up with Little Heart so I could share my K rations with her. After a time, I took along extra food so she could take some back to her people. Look how happy she looks. She never tried to talk to me. I suspect that she didn't know English. I'd seen a lot of kids over here that were shell-shocked by the fighting around them, and they just plain stopped talking, laughing, or playing. All I knew was that I needed to see that little thing as often as I could. Somehow looking at her made all the combat make some sense, some sort of sense. I felt like I was doing all this warren for her, for kids just like her. One day, when I showed up at our spot, Little Heart wasn't there. I got real scared and sick inside at the thought that she might have come to harm. So I toted my pack full of my usual load of K-rations and I set out for the village. When I stumbled into her village with the food, no one was there. Then Little Heart ran out of a fallen down hut and hugged my legs. Next, women, old men, and children poured out of their huts. Little Heart pulled me into hers. I bet he was so glad to see her, having been afraid that something happened to her. There, sitting in a hammock, was a very old man that looked weary and spent. So you must be Tucky Joe. I'm Linus Zavala, he said as he smiled. You can speak English, I said surprised like. Of course I can, I learned it in school, he smiled. 
Turns out that he was the only one that could. You have been very kind to my granddaughter, he added as he motioned a little heart. I smiled at her. She's an angel, all right. Doesn't say much, though, I said. She hasn't spoken since she saw her mother killed by soldiers. Her father and brother were taken. His voice trailed off. Your name is the only thing she says. Do you folks see lots of soldiers around here? I asked, trying to gauge where the enemy troops might be. No, he answered. We were grateful to see them leave. We don't know where they are. They took all of our young men and food. Now we are starving, the old man said as he cried. But you got a river right here. There must be lots of fish in it. They took all our nets and fishing baskets. We have no way of getting the fish out of the river. I thought for a minute. Have your women folk line the shore tonight, right at dusk. I promise you there will be fish, more fish than you can ever eat. I called out as I ran for camp. That evening, I waited until the sun started setting. I sneaked to the ordnance shed and got me an armload of dynamite and fuses and a charge box. I made my way to the river's edge just north of the village. I assembled a bundle of dynamite, set a long line of fuse, and swam it out to a group of rocks in the center of the river. I swam back to the shore and connected the fuse lines to the charger. I waited till I could see the women folk line the shore. I set the magneto and pushed the plunger down. Boom! <coughs> Excuse me. Boom, boom. <coughs> I'm so sorry. <coughs> I guess I said boom too loud. <coughs> the water commenced to boil, then shot straight up into the air. I'm going to pause for a second. <coughs> No, I'm okay. And look at the fish. They're gonna have fish. <clears throat> fish started falling out of the sky. They landed all over the bank. <clears throat> Women and children were running back and forth, gathering them up and putting them into their baskets. <clears throat> They were laughing and singing as they did it. From that day on, they all called me that boy who made it rain fish. <clears throat> they feasted on them fish for days. What they couldn't eat right away, they dried and preserved. <clears throat> I even shot a water buffalo and butchered it for them so they had fresh meat. The whole focus of my life came to providing for them people. That is, when I wasn't out on recons and fighting the war. Look at the fish. <clears throat> well, after a time, I told my sergeant about the village folk. He reckoned since they hated the enemy as much as we did, they weren't spies. So he let the children come up to the fence line and even gave them supplies that were being airlifted into us on the landing strip we built. Little Heart was my constant shadow almost everywhere I went, except for combat missions. She was right behind me. Whenever I went to her village, it was like I was at home, surrounded by my kinfolk. Everybody in my outfit had grown to love them too. Then one day, my unit was rousted from his sleep earlier than usual. Enemy troops are headed this way, the sergeant barked. High command has ordered firebombing of the jungle all around us, so we have to evacuate, he added. Get up, get up, we're bombing the jungle, he barked as he ran from tent to tent. Sarge, what about Little Heart? The villagers, I called out in pure panic. 
Ain't got time, kid. Ain't got time to save him, the Sarge whispered. Sarge, if I run as fast as I can and gather him up and bring him here, can we evacuate them with our troops? I begged him. The Sarge nodded his permission, and I took off running. I ran so hard and fast that I could taste blood in the back of my throat. I arrived just in time, and they all followed me back to the base. Some of the boys in my outfit picked them up and threw them into the back of transport trucks. Little Heart was in my arms, hugging me as hard as she could. The bombs were screaming into the jungle right behind me. Everywhere we looked was fire. Tucky Joe, Tucky Joe, she cried as she hugged me even tighter. I had to peel her off of me and throw her into the transport truck. She screamed and screamed. I suspect she only really felt safe with me. Now I was taking that away from her. I started sobbing and she reached for me and tried to jump out of the truck. No, little heart, you gotta go, you gotta, I sputtered. Then the truck rolled out with a jerk. Her grandpa held her back as she screamed my name. That's the last time I ever saw that little girl. Finally, the war ended and I went home to Kentucky. I'd been wounded several times, but came home in one piece. I ended up marrying up with my darling Frida and we moved to Marshall, Michigan, bought a farm, and raised a family together. She gave me eight beautiful children. We've been married for nigh on 65 years now. I have 24 grandchildren, 28 great-grandchildren, and even one great-great-grandchild. But in all these years, I don't think a day has passed that my mind didn't fall on thoughts of little heart and set to wondering about her. There he is when he got married. And then all those, all that family, he and his wife and their eight kids. Now, like a lot of old soldiers, I've been getting sick a lot these days, spending much of my time at the Veterans Hospital Clinic over in Battle Creek Way. Frida tried to get me in to see the specialists that could help me, but there's such a waiting list we never seem to be able to see them. It just seemed to be getting worse and worse. That was really hard to take. What was really hard to take was that my eyesight and hearing was all but gone couldn't afford one of them newfangled hearing aids, and eye surgery was expensive. Couldn't pay for it. Then one day, on one of my routine visits to the Veterans Administration, a new nurse came into the room. She was soft and gentle and seemed to really care. She had my thick file in her hand. She opened it and studied it closely. Is this a photo of you when you were enlisted, she asked, as she showed me an old wrinkled picture. You were very handsome, she said as she smiled. That's my Johnny, Frida whispered as she stroked my head. I have some new medicine for you today, Mr. Wallen. This will be a lot better than that you are using now, she said as she examined me. I had a meeting with specialists and they've agreed to take your case. You need very specific medicines for your heart condition. They have prescribed the finest for you to take, she said, as she listened to my heart. How much is all this gonna cost, Frida asked. It's all been taken care of, the nurse said as she held Frida's hands. And how did you ever get Johnny in to see the specialist? We've been on a waiting list for what seems like years. We finally gave up hope, Frida said. Why are you doing this for me, girly? I asked as I searched the nurse's face. Mm -mm. 
I sometimes have a hard time reading the end of this story. It's emotional. Because I'm taking care of you now. Just like you did for me so many years ago. Then she leaned into my face. Tucky Joe will only have the best. Only the best for you, my Tucky Joe, the nurse whispered as tears rolled down her cheeks. She rolled up her sleeve and showed the birthmark on her arm. It was shaped like a perfect heart. And it says, Nurse Sabala was true to her word and saw to it personally that Johnny Wallen received the finest care possible for the rest of his days. She later told him that she had been looking for him all those years and had lived in hope that she could thank him for his kindness. It was because of him that she came to America. She attended nursing school, married, and became the mother of three sons. Two of them are practicing physicians and one is an engineer. She felt that none of this would have been possible had she not been saved and fed and cared for by Tucky Joe. Johnny Wallen was one of the most decorated soldiers in his company. He got two purple hearts, three bronze stars, a bronze arrowhead, the Asian Pacific Campaign Medal, the Korean Service Medal, the Combat Badge, the Good Conduct Medal, and the World War II Victory Medal. But to Johnny Wallen, the medal that meant to most was a small silver heart on a chain that Nurse Sabella gave him shortly before his death. He was buried with it pinned to his chest. On the back of it was inscribed, For my Tucky Joe from your little heart. Johnny Wallen passed away on January 10, in January 2010 at the age of 85. This book is longer, but it's a good one. And this is Tucky Joe and Little Heart by Patricia Polacco. Thanks for letting me read it to you today.